Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event from Study Abroad to the State Department, how developing global perspectives supports US foreign policy. As you enter from the waiting room, I would ask you to take note of the information on the screen, which includes our contact information should you have any technical issues. And we will begin shortly. Once again, welcome everyone. We are pleased to have you with us here today at the conclusion of International Education Week 2022 at an event offering important insight into the nexus between study abroad, US foreign policy, and State Department internships, fellowships, and career opportunities. Welcome again, my name is Anthony Kolaha, and I'm the Director of the Office of Global Educational Programs here at the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. In this role, I oversee efforts to attract qualified international students to the United States through our Education USA Global Educational Advising Network and to increase and diversify Americans taking part in study abroad through our USA Study Abroad programs, such as the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program, the Critical Language Scholarship or CLS program, and our ideas program to build study abroad capacity on US college and university campuses, among other initiatives. As Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said, international education enhances cultural and linguistic diversity and helps to develop cross-cultural communication skills, foreign language competencies, enhanced self-awareness, and understanding of diverse perspectives. At the State Department, we are all committed to increasing study abroad opportunities for all Americans. We are dedicated to both increasing and to diversifying the population of American students who go abroad. And we want more students to study safely in a wide array of destinations around the world, reflective of all the countries with which the United States interacts. Viewed collectively, these goals are our call to action here at the State Department. And we answer that call by supporting thousands of Americans to study, research, or teach overseas every year through the Gilman Program, the CLS Program, and our flagship Fulbright Program. And while we achieve success in promoting and enhancing study abroad, at the State Department, we have an ambi another ambitious goal, which is the hiring of the next generation of dedicated, talented US diplomats and civil servants to advance US foreign policy effort, efforts in service to the American people. And today we hope you will see the same clear link between these two goals that we do. As you'll hear in detail today, the connection between the global perspectives developed through study abroad and the Americans who answer the call of public service in joining the State Department is crystal clear. Our hiring data tells us this and we see it every day. With today's program, you'll get a front row seat as we explore and examine these important connections. And it's through the Gilman program that we are hosting today's event. The Gilman program provides outstanding US undergraduate students who receive federal Pell Grants with scholarships to study or intern abroad. And since the program began in 2001, more than 36,000 Gilman scholars of diverse backgrounds from all US states and territories have studied and interned abroad in over 150 countries. And today you will meet some of those alumni who are now my colleagues here at the US Department of State. To today's event will look closely at the global perspectives developed through study abroad, as well as pathways to international careers with a specific emphasis on public service. And in a moment, we will hear from Secretary Blinken, who will expand upon his profound belief in the importance of study abroad and why it matters to the people of the United States. But before hearing from Secretary Blinken, I'm pleased to preview and invite you to attend our full Inside US Foreign Policy Program, a six-part virtual series kicking off in January 2023 that will focus on six major foreign policy challenges facing the US and the world today. 
Series participants will gain insights into the foreign policy making process through the lens of the department's regional bureaus, our expert functional bureaus, and with the perspectives provided through our global diplomatic missions, our US embassies and consulates found around the world. So we hope you will register and attend the next series. And you can do that by visiting and bookmarking gilmanscholarship.org, the website that you can get the latest information from. And now we are pleased to turn our attention to a guest that really needs no introduction. We're pleased that Secretary Blinken lent his strong support to engaging American students through our Inside US Foreign Policy series by sitting down for an interview with two foreign service officers and proud Gilman alumni, Jenny Abamu and Erez Grouillon. Following the secretary's interview, our program will proceed with a panel of foreign service officers discussing their work in supporting US foreign policy and talking about their study abroad experience and their own paths to public service. Finally, our program will conclude with information on ways that you can turn your global perspectives and own experiences into a State Department career. So thank you. And without further ado, I am honored to present an interview with Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the start of the second Inside US Foreign Policy webinar series presented by the US Department of State's Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs and the Benjamin A. Gilman Scholarship Program. My name is Jenny Abamu, and I'm joined by my colleague, Hermes Goulan. We are Foreign Service Officers, also known as US Diplomats, and proud Gilman Scholarship alumni. We are pleased to welcome an audience from across the United States to this very special kickoff event, where we are going into a year-long webinar series dedicated to providing a unique and in-depth look at some of the most important global challenges facing the United States today. And there is perhaps no greater source of insight and inspiration on the subject of U.S. foreign policy than our honored guest, our boss, the 71st Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Secretary Blinken's current assignment as our nation's chief diplomat may have started in January of 2021, but his career in public service has spanned over two decades. His devotion to advancing U.S. foreign policy interests and the service to American people has equipped him with a unique understanding of the crucial importance and real impact of diplomacy in the lives of all Americans. Secretary Blinken, we are delighted you could be with us today. Thank you so much, Jenny. Great to be with you. And everybody's great to be with you, too. We were just talking before we got started that you both have yes. recent additions to your families. <laughs> uh, so second children for both of you. Yes, I'm yes. in the same. I'm in the same boat. I've got uh, two <laughs> little struggle. ones too. Yes, yeah. So uh, I appreciate the fact that you've got um, a full time job at home, as well as a full time job at the State Department. But it's great to be with both of you today. Thank you so much. And Hermes, I believe you're going to start with our first question for the secretary. Yes, yes. Well, first off, just before doing questions, thank you for your time to mm -hmm. be here with us. It's a privilege for me to be among in both of your presence. Uh, but we'll kick it off and go into the, the first question. So the first question is: Why should U.S. foreign policy? and the role the Department of State plays in implementing foreign policy matter to Americans? So, you know, one of the things that we think about every single day is how does what we do here at the State Department affect the lives of our fellow citizens? Because after all, that's what we're, we're mm -hmm. here to do. We're here to make sure that hopefully um, we can help make them a little bit safer, uh, a little bit more uh, prosperous and full of opportunity, a little bit healthier. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're living now is, are two things. One is we know the world doesn't organize itself. So if the United States is not involved, if we're not engaged, if we're not leading mm -hmm. in doing some of that organizing, then one of two things is likely to happen. Either someone else, some other country steps up to do it, mm -hmm. and maybe not in a way that actually reflects our own interests and our own values, mm -hmm. or maybe just as bad, no one does it. And mm -hmm. then yeah. you tend to have yeah. a vacuum that's filled by bad things uh, before it's filled by good things. So we have an interest, and I think the American people have an interest in the United States being out there in the world and helping to organize things. But the, the flip side is equally important. On just about every issue that actually has an impact on the lives of Americans, um, it's impossible for any one country, even ourselves, to deal with these issues effectively alone. Mm. Think about a few, few of these. If mm -hmm. you're concerned about climate change, mm -hmm. we, the United States, are about 15% of global emissions. So even if we did everything right at home, we still have to find a way to account for the other 85% of yeah. emissions coming from other countries, which means we have to find ways to work with them and encourage them and support them. 
COVID we've all been living with for the past two and a half years. Even if we, again, did everything right at home, if there's a variant percolating out there somewhere, then it could come back and bite us and undermine uh, everything that we've done at home. We have to find ways to work mm -hmm. with other countries, bring them along as well in dealing with that. All of the technology that is shaping our lives, that is in our cell phones, uh, in our pockets every day, the rules, the standards, the norms by which these things get used, well, that requires working with other countries to shape and mm -hmm. decide them. Mm -hmm. And if we wanna make sure that you know, American workers and American companies get a fair deal around the world, well, that means working with other countries to do it. So it's a long way of saying our diplomats are the ones who are making sure that we're engaged, that we are mm -hmm. uh, leading, and that we're finding new ways mm -hmm. to cooperate and to coordinate and to work with other countries, and not just other countries, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. NGOs, mm -hmm. civil society, the private sector, uh, academia, all of those different groups, we have to find ways to engage uh, and hopefully to get everyone rowing in the same direction because if we don't, we're probably not gonna succeed. And again, that's what you're both doing every day as diplomats. Yeah, I think we're thinking about the future generations, like our children mm. and the kind of the world that we wanna leave for them. So this, this career is, uh, just diplomacy in writ large is, is such a rewarding career to make a change. And I think we are all doing that on a daily basis. So yes. for the average uh, American, mm -hmm. they can confide in, in our diplomatic corps. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think it's um, really fascinating that you bring up like the, the challenges that fa the face of the United States are mm -hmm. not just facing us, it's facing everyone. And we have to work right. cooperatively to be able to deal with that. Um, that's It's such an important point that we have to drive home um, for a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to ask internally within mm. the department, it, we have, you know, we, you, your work, we know you're working on a lot of things regarding retention, mm -hmm. regarding diversity, mm -hmm. um, just uh, promoting public service. Mm. Um, but for people who are inspired by this webinar, but kind of grew up like myself, mm. I grew up far from the Capitol, yep. from Texas. Yep. Um, I never saw people in my community doing this type of work. Mm. I didn't, you know. <laughs> We didn't have fancy schools or anything like that where I was. And so mm -hmm. we had, a, you know, this experience is so new for me mm -hmm. in every single way. What would, advice would you give to a student who or somebody else who's watching mm -hmm. this and is inspired but doesn't know where to start? So first, one of the things you said is really important. We want to make sure that we have a department that actually reflects the country mm -hmm. that we're here to represent in all of its diversity. And that's not just because it's the right thing to do. It's because it's the smart and necessary thing to do. Because mm -hmm. think about this, we're operating in an incredibly diverse world. Mm -hmm. And the greatest strength that we bring to the table mm -hmm. in that is our own diversity to make sure that on any given issue, on any given problem, we have a whole variety of different experiences, perspectives, knowledge, viewpoints, thinking about how to, how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And also engaging in this really diverse world uh, with, again, the unique perspectives that they bring. If we're leaving people on the sidelines, if they're not part of the team, mm -hmm. uh, if we're denying ourselves the benefit of our own diversity, we're shortchanging ourselves. We're shortchanging our foreign policy. We're shortchanging the country. So one of the things that we're, we're doing here is trying to make sure we're, build, we're building a department that really reflects the country that uh, we're here to represent. Mm -hmm. And in order to help do that, one of the most important things is actually connecting with people especially at a young age, right. especially in places that might not necessarily be thinking of a career in government, never mind mm -hmm. a career in foreign policy, just, just like you were. Mm -hmm. um, and that means reaching out. Uh, it means engaging HBCUs, for example, mm -hmm. uh, other universities or colleges or even high schools that actually have um, underrepresented communities here. Mm -hmm. but the other thing that's really powerful is we have a whole series of scholarship programs, mm -hmm. like the ones that, mm -hmm. that brought you uh, to mm -hmm. the State Department, mm -hmm. that people can benefit from. Uh, and whether it's the Gilman, uh, Wrangell, Pickering, Colin Powell, uh, the new um, scholarship fellowship mm -hmm. named after him, all of these things mm -hmm. are powerful vehicles to allow people to uh, come to the State Department who otherwise might not think of it. I'd add one other thing. For the first time ever, we managed to get into our budget working with Congress, mm -hmm. paid internships. Mm -hmm. And there That's too, it means that people who might not ha have the opportunity mm -hmm. to try things out, to come and spend a summer or, or more with the State Department, now they may be able to do that because uh, they can get their internship paid for. So all of these things are ways, and there, if you go onto the, the State Department website, uh, you can find 
um, links to all of the different uh, fellowship and scholarship programs that we have. Yeah, so that's an interesting point you make about these scholarship and fellowship programs mm -hmm. because it really creates a pipeline. That's right. And for me, I, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, was a, I'm a first generation college student. My parents had just graduated high school, um, but they always instilled in me a value for education. Mm -hmm. And the Gilman Scholarship, uh, which I received when I was a junior, afforded me the opportunity, which is a, a scholarship for those who don't know, to that State Department funded for recipients of the of the of the Pell Grant, mm -hmm. and it gives you the the it helps you to be able to study abroad. Yes, and that experience right. uh, is actually actually went to study abroad in Nicaragua, which I then served there later on as a foreign service officer. So From, how did so how did you find out about the Gilman when you were look, looking? So I was very fortunate that I had. I was put on, um, my university had an international affairs department mm -hmm. that spoke about the Gilman Scholarship. Ah. They said, uh, you qualify as a Gilman, as a Pell Grant recipient. Mm. And that put me on a path. Then I had the Gilman. I ended up receiving afterwards the Pickering uh, yes. Fellowship, which then put me on the pipeline. It's a, a program for people from unrepresented backgrounds. Mm -hmm. It gives you a contract to be a foreign service officer. Mm -hmm. And then to... Um, and it pays for your master's degree. I think that was a key to get to such, to give you the qualifications to be able to succeed within the State Department. Yeah. And, and I'm forever indebted, indebted to uh, the State Department for giving me a chance. And, I, and I've been able to excel in this career, but I think that pipeline is so pivotal. Right. And I, what I've seen now is uh, with the pandemic, some students haven't been able to to study abroad. Mm -hmm. um, is, is impacted. Now that's coming. Now that's coming back. That's coming which back is a now. Great thing. And Jenny, how did you get um, so tuned my, into the Gilman? So my path wasn't linear exactly, <laughs> but um, I did. Uh, I did um, when I was in undergrad. I did. I was looking to study abroad, and there was a little pamphlet actually. And the, uh -huh. <laughs> the study abroad uh, advisor just was like, "Here's a bunch of pamphlets," and one of them was the, a pamphlet about the Gilman Scholarship. And so I happened to read through it, and I applied and uh, got accepted. Where and did you go? Uh, I went to Cairo. Mm. I studied Arabic. Amazing. And so actually I was really bad at French. And so I said, let me try Arabic. Yeah. And so, and that, <laughs> which and actually clicked. clicked which, which, go, which, go figure. Yeah, see. exactly. And, but I mean, of course, like, you know, pathways aren't always linear. Mm. Like for example, after I left the university, I, I went to news. And so yeah, I worked. Right, you were a journalist for a while. Yes, yeah. I was a journalist for a while. And so um, then I came back to the State Department with some time. But yeah, it's like, I think that the fascinating thing is that it, um, that seed that was planted when I was younger. Op it opened your... Opened my pathway to be able to do this. Yeah. And I also served in the Arabic-speaking country mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, in Jeddah, uh, last tour. Amazing experiences. Mm -hmm. So all, all I would ask is, while I did grow up in Brooklyn, New York, I went to the Midwest, and some irony there, because being in the Midwest made me reflect on the world that we live in, mm -hmm. and actually made me more curious, and that mm -hmm. sparked my interest to, to study abroad, and I was a small rural town, and the, the, the youth who were there working, I was working in the high schools, I tried to pass the same information to them about these programs that exist, mm -hmm. whether you're in, in rural America, whether you're in a big city, to be able to represent the United States. Um, and I think that's, like you mentioned earlier, we're stronger because of, of our diversity. Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of ask you a question, why mm -hmm. do you think it's so vital for Americans, American students to study abroad? You know, from my own experience, uh, I had the opportunity to do that at a young age. When I was nine years old, mm -hmm. I, was, I was born in New York being raised in New York, mm -hmm. and then moved abroad, moved to France in my case when I was nine. And I actually stayed there until I was 18 years old. Wow. And it was a life-changing experience because what it does is, first, it gives you the opportunity to see your own country through someone else's exactly. eyes. Yeah. And that's a very powerful thing. Right. And you can see uh, the good, you can see the, mm -hmm. the less good, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you can see the in-between. Yeah. Um, but you get a chance to see what your country looks like from another perspective. And of course, you get exposed to another country, another culture, maybe in the case of, in my case, because I was in, in Europe and a chance to travel, uh, not just in, in France, but mm -hmm. all around Europe, a chance to see what all sorts of different cultures and countries look like. That in and of itself is incredibly enriching. Mm -hmm. And because we're living at a time when the world is so interconnected, right. and I suspect many of the people yeah. listening to us every day have some ability uh, just uh, through their social media and, and uh, being connected to be exposed to different parts of the world in ways that previous generations weren't, actually experiencing that firsthand, um, meeting people, mm -hmm. making connections, um, making, uh, making friendships, and then learning uh, about different perspectives, mm -hmm. it's, a, 
it's a, a unique experience. And the other thing that was really powerful for me was that it also sometimes turns you into a junior diplomat <laughs> because you're constantly having conversations exactly. about right, right. the United States, yeah. about your own country, about what we're doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it um, uh, maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's even a, an argument or a debate, mm -hmm. um, but it really um, creates, a, I think, a connection, a different kind of connection mm -hmm. with the United States for you. It also almost makes you a, a junior representative uh, for the country. It's one of the things that got me interested in, be, in being part of diplomacy. Yeah, or even fumbling through an, a foreign language and trying to have those debates, you know, I think is uh, studying another language really gives you a perspective, like you said, of the other culture, mm -hmm. of, a, of the other worldview that then helps you um, be able to better understand how does the U.S. more about your own country. That's, that's right. You it's, that's, it's, it's, you it's a little bit of a paradox exactly. because going... Going far away, going right. abroad, actually gives you perspective. Uh, a different perspective on your own country. I and mean, you maybe feel a different, different and new kinds of attachments to your own country that you maybe take for granted mm -hmm. yeah. when you're living here. The, the thing is this, too. Because this world is so interconnected, mm -hmm. having an opportunity, especially at a relatively young age, to spend even a little bit of time, six months, a year, right. somewhere else, is something that's likely to stay with you for, uh, for a lifetime. And one of the other things about, uh, about the State Department is this. We see now that so many people, like Jenny, just like you, um, come here after having had other careers mm -hmm. doing something, doing something mm -hmm. different. But precisely because of that experience, you're coming here and enriching the department mm -hmm. uh, in a really powerful way. You're bringing mm -hmm. the knowledge, the expertise mm -hmm. of having uh, done something else and adding, and adding that to the mix. Mm -hmm. So I'd also say to people who are thinking about this, even if it's not something you do immediately, maybe it's something you come to. Right. Um, and... Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's something you do do quickly, and th but then you go off to do something else. Mm -hmm. That's fine, too. I think yeah. it can be uh, incredibly rewarding for people to have some time doing public service, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what they do for the rest of mm -hmm. their careers. Right. And I have to say, at least for me, there's something unique about this because I get to go to work every day with the American flag behind my back, either literally or at least figuratively. And to me, at least, there's nothing quite like that. There are right. so many different things you can do with your mm -hmm. life, with your career, that are re all rewarding in different ways if you're fortunate mm -hmm. enough to have uh, some opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, at least, there's nothing quite like being able to um, represent uh, your own country. Uh, yeah. That's a unique experience. And to have that, even for a little while, experience. is something that will stay with you for a lifetime. Yeah, thanks for Experience and responsibility. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. You, we bring our families and our communities along with us yeah. that maybe they may not have had those experiences. and. We, they get to see that world That's and right. visit us or uh, learn a little bit more about U.S. foreign policy. So I think it, it's a pl privilege and a, res and a responsibility, That's as right. Jenny mentioned, uh, to, to do this type of work and this public service. Um, but Secretary, thank you for your time and, and for this conversation. I think yes, our, those who are tuning in and listening really can walk away with just uh, hopefully with some passion for this work and to study abroad and get mm -hmm. those experiences. And I'd say thank you both. And first, you're both incredible examples of um, what it means to not only um, get a fellowship and get to spend some time here, but actually then to really make uh, careers out of it and uh, to do so well in, in representing our country. Uh, and then I simply say to people who are listening, um, hope you'll consider this. Give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, look into it. A ask a, uh, a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, check out our website. Uh, a lot of information's there, and uh, then really give some thought to um, to public service. If you uh, and there, the there's more support now than there's been for that, mm -hmm. um, and um, my hope is that maybe you'll find ways to spend a little bit of time, and maybe even a lot of time, with us here at the State Department. Thank you. I am so excited about our next part of our session. My name is Jenny Abamu. Again, I did a quick wardrobe change. Just kidding. I was, <laughs> this is obviously, that video was obviously pre-recorded, but um, I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Hermes Galan, who was my co-interviewer during the secretary's interview, and also Naomi Matos and Wes Jeffers. We are so excited to share our work, uh, our study abroad experiences, and our joint journey to the Foreign Service. Um, we, we are going to, I will have a few questions for the panelists to begin with, and then we will also take questions from you all, the audience. Um, so please prepare your questions um, 
uh, think about what you want to ask. And so we're able to be able to take your questions and you can put those, submit them via the chat and we'll take as many as we can. Um, and we're going to start off by talking, I want everyone to kind of do a little bit of introduction for themselves. I know one thing that I'm always interested in when I see foreign service officers are, where have you served? A little bit about your academic background and your motivation for joining the foreign service. So if we could start talking a little bit about that with uh, Hermes, uh, give us a little bit of a little rundown about yourself. Sure. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where, wherever we're tuning, you're tuning in from. Uh, you all, my name is Hermes Puyon. You all heard a little bit about my background briefly, but what, what I'll, further I'll add is, you know, this wasn't a career that I expected to join. Uh, I think many of my colleagues might be in, in a similar boat. Um, as I mentioned, from Brooklyn, New York, a first generation college student. My family's from the uh, Dominican Republic, so, so, so also first generation American. And for me, I, I attend this university at DePaul University for my undergraduate studies in Greencastle, Indiana, and then went to a graduate school at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. I've served in Djibouti, which is in East Africa, of uh, points if you know where th that's, that was located. And then me, I went to serve in Managua, Nicaragua. Uh, I was there as a consular officer. Then I served in our operations center, which is a 24 seven center monitoring the world and working closely with, with our secretary. And now I work in the US mission to the Organization of American States, a multilateral institution based in DC. But, um, and in terms of my motivation for joining the foreign service, I, for me personally, this, this, I, wanted, I wanted to pursue a career in international affairs as a way to learn a little bit more about my own heritage. And I really delve in, in college into books on the history of the African diaspora, the history of um, indigenous people in the Americas, looking at the island of the Dominican Republic, looking at the history of Europe and what was going on uh, during that period. And that just triggered my uh, interest. And someone came to speak to me similar to this and told me you can learn languages. State Department will pay for you to learn languages, will pay for you to live overseas. And then from that point on, I was, uh, I knew it was something that I wanted to do during, during my career. But I, I'll leave it at that for now and look forward to our discussion. And uh, I, remember, I see there's some Brooklyn fans in the house. So, I mean, if you, if you see your place, people are saying go Brooklyn over there, so that's exciting. Um, and we're gonna go from Brooklyn all the way to West Virginia. Uh, Wes Jeffers, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Wes Jeffers. I'm so happy to be here. I'm joining you from a beautiful Saturday morning in New Zealand. Um, so I am from the small town of Petersburg, West Virginia. It's only a couple hundred people. And I've been in the Foreign Service for about 12 years now, a little over 12 years, actually. Um, just like my colleagues have been saying, you know, I didn't really know about this career path. Um, and I just, you know, I got really lucky with a lot of scholarships and fellowships, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, but it kind of brought me to where I am today. But you know, I'm also from a small town. My parents were both disabled growing up. My mom had polio before there was a vaccine for it. My dad has muscular dystrophy. So I kind of grew up taking care of them. Um, but I got kind of lucky in high school where I went to a governor's honors academy that the state of West Virginia held. I met some exchange students there from Russia. And that actually kind of piqued my interest in international affairs. Um, after that, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go to Tulane University in New Orleans, where I studied political science and sociology. And at Tulane, I met an ambassador in residence, which is a program the State Department runs. And he told me all about the Foreign Service as a career path. Um, he also talked to me about a few of our different scholarship and fellowship opportunities. So then I was able to get a Thomas Pickering Graduate Foreign Affairs Fellowship, which gave me the ability to go and get a master's degree and then bring me into the foreign service. So it gives you an education and a job. And at the same time, I got a Fulbright fellowship to Russia. Um, so I was able to do both of those after I graduated. I went to Russia for a year. I taught English and I did some research there. And then I was able to start graduate school at Columbia University where I got a master's in international affairs. And then I was able to join the foreign service in 2010. Um, in the Foreign Service, I've served first in the Republic of Congo in Brazzaville. Bonus points if you know that there are two Congos. So I was in the smaller Congo, not DRC. 
Um, after that, I was in Toronto, Canada, and then Islamabad, Pakistan. And then I spent two assignments in Washington, DC, one in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, working as a desk officer for our Western Europe countries. That just means I kind of represented our interests from Washington, DC and working with our embassies there. And then I worked as a press officer in the Bureau of African Affairs. So I would work with our spokesperson and others, you know, doing different communications uh, for US policy in Africa at large. And now I'm in Wellington, New Zealand, where I'm our deputy public affairs officer, doing all of our public engagement, our public programs. That means all of our cultural programs, sports, education, and also managing all of our different exchange programs. So now I actually get to manage programs like the Fulbright, which I was you know, a participant in a long time ago. Um, that's a little about me. Super excited to be here. Um, you know, there aren't so many West Virginians in the Foreign Service, so I'm very proud to be from West Virginia. It's the most beautiful state. Sorry, everybody. Um, but, you know, if any of you are from West Virginia and this is something, you know, totally new to you hearing about this career, happy to talk to you more about it. It's very exciting and it's been a great career. Thank you. Wes, I was waiting for you to say that you did something with Russian, but you'll see that sometimes in the State Department, you may be a Russian expert and do nothing with your Russian language. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Now, Naomi, please tell us about yourself. Sure. Um, good evening from the lovely Rome, Italy. Um, everyone's repping a certain place where they're from. And I must say, I'm kind of jealous because I don't really have a hometown. I would say, because I'm a military brat, so I was born in Japan and I moved every two to four years domestically. So I was either in Virginia or I was in California. But my adult life, I settled in Virginia in the DC um, area because I went to the College of William & Mary, which is a awesome public university. We've been awesome since uh, 1693. We're the second oldest university in the United States. Just have to wrap a little bit of my alma mater. Um, so I graduated in 05, where I uh, doubled in marketing and Black studies. And my first, I didn't really have a entree into the Foreign Service, but I did have the opportunity through my university to study abroad. 20 years ago, I was actually in Italy, in Florence. Um, and then uh, with my business school, we went to Southeast Asia. And that really opened my eyes to the world outside of the United States, even though I grew up moving around, it was mainly domestically. So when I was moving around and then when I went to study abroad, I just really had an awesome experience. And it was like the Secretary of State said, you know, you learn a little bit more about your country through other people's eyes and you kind of become a de facto diplomat. And a lot of people, especially in Southeast Asia, did not exactly see people like me. Um, so when I moved up to DC along with the rest of uh, William & Mary, and I started out doing consulting like a lot of us did, and I immediately got bored after a year and a half, I was looking into different uh, career opportunities. And I grew up in a family of public service, my dad in the Marine Corps and my mom working for the government. And so I decided to go into the State Department to be one of the faces of America. And so since January 2009, um, I've kind of hopscotched around the world. I've been in New Delhi, India, where I was a consular officer. Then I went to Hesipi, Brazil, where I was American Citizens uh, Section Chief for protecting all those lovely Americans in Brazil. And then I started out my public diplomacy work as a press officer in Islamabad, Pakistan. And then I started out in, um, on the continent of Africa, where I was the liaison between all the public affairs shops in Southern Africa. Um, for a bit, and then I became the public affairs officer doing all the public diplomacy um, work in and programming in Luanda, Angola, which is in Southern Africa. Then I made my way up west in West Africa to Ghana. And now I find myself in Rome, where I'm the public affairs officer at the U.S. mission to the U.N. agencies here. Um, so I switched from bilat work to multilat, which is a whole other beast, um, but I work with the three food and agriculture agencies, which I'm sure you guys have heard a lot in the news lately, especially World Food Program, because of the focus on the global food security crisis right now. Um, so yeah, that in a nutshell is me. Looking forward to the conversation. Amazing. Um, and Naomi, you touched on a really great point that, you know, people sometimes have a conception in their, in their minds about what 
an American looks like? What is an American? And I love this panel right now because I think that we, we really do represent um, a lot of the diversity in America, a lot of different things, a lot of different experiences, world experiences that the, our country has to offer. And like the secretary was saying, you know, it's not diversity in the State Department. It's not just uh, the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And so kind of seeing all of our different faces here on this panel today is a great um, way to kind of introduce um, that, you know, our diplomats our, our diplomats have different faces. They have different backgrounds. Uh, we have we all have different life stories, and I want to dive right into those life stories. But first, I want to touch on a bit of policy stuff. And so, because I have one question I know is really interesting, and people always want, I I wondered as someone who did not come from a State Department background, as I didn't go into myself that much, but I'm from Texas. Um, I I was actually uh, in news for a while before I came to the State Department, so I was a journalist. Um, and so, just kind of. One question I always had before, and I want to have I want each of you to kind of touch on in just a short, brief statement. Um, how do you see your role right now shaping and guiding or implementing U.S. foreign policy? And Naomi, I'll start with you since we. Okay, so my current role. Um, so, <clears throat> as a public diplomacy officer, we're in country to explain you know, why we're here and why it matters. And I think my role in shaping foreign policy would be, um, you know, just developing those relationships with our target audiences. In my case, it'd be other, <laughs> other member states, other diplomats and the UN agencies themselves, but really um, getting the ground truth and figuring out what's happening on the ground in the countries where, you know, food and agriculture organization serving and where World Food Program is, and just finding out, you know, where the hunger hotspots are and um, where we're at with, you know, impending famines and things like that. So we can report back to DC so that we can, you know, advocate for more funds for certain programs, um, maybe push for uh, a certain policy change to make sure um, that we, you know, head into the direction of our main goal, which is to alleviate global hunger. So that's basically how I see uh, my current role here at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. agencies in Rome. And Ermes, how would you answer that question? Um, this, I mean, it's a little bit more, uh, for me, I'm a political cond officer. I'm a political officer now at the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. So it is similar to Naomi in terms of being a multilateral institution, but we have some uh, political US interests that we're, we want to advance in the Western Hemisphere. And the OAS is a great mechanism to advance those US interests alongside other member states and building consensus. So there's a lot of, of relationship building and it's, this, and it's similar when you are a, uh, at a bilateral uh, relation or, or embassy where you're trying to build relations and to advance uh, the U.S. perspective or the U.S. interest in mind. Uh, and a lot of this can be on regional polit politics in terms of the U.S. stance on Venezuela to the U.S. stance, uh, you know, common beliefs that we have in, in the Western Hemisphere region on the values um, in terms of democratic values and giving ensuring there's a platform for, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a platform for particularly marginalized voices to be at, this, at, this, at the center of, of politics. So that's just an example in, in terms of some of the, in the Western hemisphere, but on my next job, I actually will be at the, I'll be a coordinator, deputy course coordinator for our orientation class for all new foreign service and civil service personnel and hopefully I can see some of those or our panelists when they passing through that orientation class, joining the foreign service or the civil service, but really at the, if in, in that context, it would be you, where you influence others and how they, have, they can give them the resources to be able to succeed is also important. And we can advance a foreign policy in that way. Thank you. Yes, hopefully we'll see some of our participants in those, in those, in those classes. Um, Wes, uh, how do you see your role all the way in New Zealand? Um, what's going on there? Yeah, great question. Um, so I'm also a public diplomacy officer like Jenny and Naomi. Um, so here in New Zealand at the U.S. Embassy, 
We're really trying to advance U.S. foreign policy in New Zealand and in the Pacific at large. You know, we also cover Samoa, we cover the Cook Islands, and we cover Niue. And then we work with our other U.S. embassies across the Pacific to, you know, advance things that are of interest to the United States in this region. And we have a lot of interest here, especially in trade, in business, and in environments. You know, we're doing a lot to mitigate kind of the devastating effects of climate change here because some of the Pacific countries are the most at risk for climate change. You know, if we don't work to stop a lot of what could happen in the future, a lot of these islands could be under the water. Um, so it's something we're all trying to work together on in this region. Um, and here, you know, I like how Naomi mentioned we're really here to kind of explain what the United States is doing, explain our policies, have these discussions with people. You know, you might be surprised, but even in countries like New Zealand, which have a lot of access to the United States, there's a lot of tourism between the United States and New Zealand. There are still a significant number of New Zealanders that have no interaction with Americans that haven't been to the United States. And so it's really important for us to get out there in the country we're in, as well as the islands that I mentioned, and meet people, have discussions, let them talk to an American, let them see what an American is like, and talk about things that are of mutual interest to us. And, you know, whenever we're having disagreements as countries too, that's where these conversations are really beneficial. Sometimes it just takes a couple of people to get in a room together and sit down, discuss some things about our policies, and then we're able to find some agreements. So that's a, a little bit of what we do here. And participants, we have over 350 people. Please don't forget to put your questions into the chat because we are monitoring that. Um, and, and now I have another question for Naomi. Naomi, I want I wanted to ask you, what makes you effective at what you do? I, I know that people are probably always thinking like, what skills do I need to be a foreign service officer? So in just kind of thinking about that, what makes you effective at your job? Huh. Okay. Well, I think um, I think my ability to identify it's really important to me to identify like who's not in the room and who should be there in the conversations. You know, who's not on the on the team, who's not on the country team, meaning the leadership team on the in the mission in the embassy. Um, who are we not talking to um, when we're doing these programs? Who are we not reaching? Who, who in the in the country that you're in, um, you know, in their history books, who are they not mentioning? Because really, um, when we're doing these programs, when we're trying to reach out to people, furthering U.S. interests, we need to know what those audiences are thinking about us and what the role they play in the country that they're in. Because oftentimes, you know, it gives you a different perspective and it makes sure that you know exactly what's going on on the ground so you can make effective programming and um, you can achieve the goals of your mission. I often say that whenever I'm working on like public diplomacy programming, I like to approach it from the United States perspective as a, from a spot of uh, authenticity, awareness and openness. Um, I like to do programs like we did um, back in June, we brought the senior advisor of, um, uh, to uh, racial diversity and inclusion for USDA to come out and talk about um, some corrective programming that they're doing to really bolster racial equity in Black farmers. Um, and we brought that speaker to um, the member states uh, to learn more about how we're recognizing what we've done in the past and how we can correct it so that it's more inclusive and people are more involved in the economic development of the country. And the feedback we got was like, well, thank you so much for, you know, for being so aware and to being so authentic and open to sharing um, your lessons learned and how you are moving past that. And it just creates a, a better relationship with other countries that not necessarily are like-minded, but we can work together in the future. And I think that's a, that is what makes highly effective programming and how I've been able to do the job on the ground. I really like that, Naomi, the authenticity point. That's a, a lot about just being true to yourself. And so that's something that a lot of the audience can take home with themselves is just kind of be true to yourself. And you know, sometimes diplomacy can feel stilted and distant, 
but that's that's really um, a great point. Now, Jeff, I have a question for you about kind of developing your global perspective. Um, tell me, how do you feel like you came to understand the world of global issues? Like you came from West Virginia. Sometimes people don't always think that that's the most, you know, <laughs> maybe cosmopolitan area. But, you know, you have a great understanding of, you know, your your career has spanned so wide and vast and you, you've grown in, under, in understanding of all, of all these things. How do you feel that you got to from where you were to where where you are now? Yeah, so it's really kind of interesting because I grew up in this tiny town of just a couple hundred people where people really don't leave, you know, like no one really leaves the town for university or, you know, even for travel or anything else. So I didn't really have any, you know, role models or examples to look at. And it really wasn't until that camp that I mentioned, this Governor's Honors Academy in high school, where I met these Russian exchange students. I'd at that point in my life, you know, I must have been 16 or 17 then, I'd never met anyone from outside the United States ever. Um, so that was the first time. And so it was my first time really hearing someone speak a foreign language from that country, meeting a foreign person. So I kind of spent a lot of my time at this camp with these exchange students, just being like, oh my gosh, you know, teach me some of your language. Like, talk to me about what you do on a daily basis. Like, what do you do at school? What do you do after school? Um, and then, you know, I kept in touch with them after that, and I just developed such an interest in the world um, after that, you know, obviously my high school didn't have a Russian language program. We did have Spanish, and I was in the Spanish classes, but it wasn't totally clicking with me. So after that, I took it upon myself. I bought some Russian, you know, language textbooks and started teaching myself after school. I would actually go to a teacher's classroom and crack open one of these books and kind of do my own self-study while I was in her classroom to try and teach myself this language. Um, and yeah, it just, it really opened an interest in me. And then, you know, before that, I actually was really big into painting and art. So I kind of wanted, if I was going to go to university, I wanted to go for art. But after that experience, I realized like, actually, I'm really interested in international affairs. So then I started looking at universities with international affairs programs. And then when I started at Tulane University, you know, I started taking international affairs classes and I just found them so interesting. You know, I took classes about all kinds of different regions, you know, classes specializing in Japan and Venezuela and all kinds of countries, just because I thought it was all really, really fascinating and I enjoyed it. Um, so then I just kind of went from there, you know, it was, it wasn't something that I knew I'd be interested in, but once, once it came into my life, it really sparked this huge interest. Um, and it's never stopped. You know, I love learning. I think that's something that a lot of foreign service officers share. We love to learn, um, and we love to be challenged about things. So it's, it's still fun for me to learn about new countries, new languages, new cultures. And I think that's why I really love this job. Okay, so you said you said a few times at the, in your opening that you got lucky in a few things. You're actually just a really hard worker if you taught yourself Russian. <laughs> He's like, I got lucky I was in Tulane. No, sir, you worked very, very hard. <laughs> and so uh, just to let you all know also that the, we, we also uh, realized that the chat might have had some issues. So just please feel free to put your questions inside and um, continue to add your questions to the chat. I believe they're gonna work. work we've kind of resolve the issue. Um, so uh, Armez, I had a question for you. Um, you kind of uh, wanted to ask you, why do you think it's important your work that you're doing to the American people? Because I know like foreign policy can always seem like it's so outside, like somewhere else. I'm outside my screen with my hands. Um, but tell me, why do you feel like your work is important to the American people? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that question. And I I think the job that I, you know, I've done several jobs and where I saw the impact directly to US citizens was when I was a consular officer in uh, Embassy Managua, assisting uh, US citizens that were trying to leave during the COVID pandemic or when there was, I was there during the peak of the of political crisis in 2018. And we had to print out emergency passports to help out US citizens who wanted to get on a plane the next day to leave the country, um, and also we, if you if you uh, when you have a child overseas and you're a U.S. citizen, 
you have something called the child report or birth abroad uh, process where if you have five years after the age of 14 and two five years in total presence in the United States, two after the age of 14, you can pass on citizenship to your children, even if they're not born in the United States. So I think being a consular officer was uh, an amazing experience to see the impact working with US citizens, even sometimes um, I had to go to the prisons, um, you know, provide certain services that we have for US citizens. So I think the consular experience was very direct. I could see the impact that I was having to US citizens and on, on foreign policy in general, whether it's uh, more of these on the policy side, like right now I'm working on the US mission to the uh, organization of American states, the, we the Western hemisphere foreign policy is domestic policy to a certain degree. So a lot of the things that are impacting the region a lot of people in the United States have, a, whether through their heritage, a connection to Latin America or to the Western Hemisphere. Um, so it's very easy for me to see, uh, whether it's through the, the diaspora, how we engage the, you know, to the degree that we're working on issues impacting the impact of diaspora, uh, but also just advancing and, and something that Naomi mentioned, who's not in the room, you know, which voices need to be elevated and how do you ensure that, um, more rights are given to more people across the the hemisphere and across the world. And I think that is not unique to the, to the Western hemisphere. So whether as a political officer, or as a consular officer, I could see the impact that I was having that I do have for US citizens. Oh, amazing. No, that's a really wonderful point. And I want to dive right in a, a little bit deeper to some of the Q&A that we have from our audience members. And so one of the first questions that we have from participants, and I'll, um, I guess I'll let, uh, I think, Jeff, maybe you can answer this. Um, what, what advice would you get, would you have for faculty, um, for fellowships, scholarships, and career advisors um, about how they can best prepare students for careers with the State Department? Jeff, how would you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for faculty, you know, one of the most important things is just being aware of these programs. You know, back when I joined the Foreign Service, I think there were still a lot of high schools and other places and colleges not aware of programs like the Pickering. So I think the fact that you're tuned into this and <laughs> you're making yourself more aware and more educated about these opportunities is the first step. Um, but then just being able to share these opportunities is really important. Um, we also have some offices in the Department of State that focus on these different programs and they can always supply more information if you get in touch with them about the specifics of each scholarship and each different program. But really having the knowledge and then being able to talk to your students about it is one of the most important things. I will also say, you know, for a lot of us in the Foreign Service, um, and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same way, I love being connected with people who are interested in the Foreign Service because it can be such a, a mystery sometimes to think about how you get into it or what it what you actually do once you're in the Foreign Service and what you do as a diplomat. So throughout my career, I've been connected with many, many people who are just interested in the Foreign Service, students, you know, looking to possibly join the Foreign Service. And, you know, I'm happy to have phone calls with them, talk to them, have Zooms with them. And I'm sure my colleagues do the same. So, you know, if you know of any Foreign Service officers or if you get connected with us or others, that's always a possibility too. I just want to add one thing on, on that question. You want to be in contact with your diplomat and resident for your particular part of the country. Uh, that's the role that they're playing uh, to assist. So really uh, get connected with them. Look at our fellowship websites. For those who are sophomore and juniors, there's a program that I did at Howard University called the Wrangell Summer Scholars Program. It's not a commitment to the State Department, but it's a program that has State Department funded uh, that gives you an introduction to the State Department. I also want to recommend that people look at the 13 dim dimensions of the of the state of the Foreign Service to look at what are the skills needed to be a Foreign Service officer. Um, and when you turn 20 years old, you can take the Foreign Service uh, written exam. There, it, it's free. You can take it every I believe it's every 11 months, um, and it's it's many people have may not have to you know it's it, just take it as many times as you, as you can even just to get a sense of what is the test like uh to be familiar with the test so just some uh 
concrete things that you can recommend, which recommendations for you to consider. Thank you so much for all of those uh, recommendations. I think that's super helpful. And um, just a little few reminders: if you are, if you do have questions, um, you can also send them to ask question person number one or ask question person number two. And um, yes, please also check our websites at careers.state.gov um, about uh, looking, look at uh, there's some uh, links in the chat where you can see um, more advice for faculty members. And you can also see things about the 13 dimensions and uh, 13 dimensions in the, the scholarship programs uh, mentioned. And now another question, and Naomi, I'll direct this towards you. How do, we, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? How do you deal with like, I'm actually a diplomat? Like, what does that even mean to me, to the people around me? Um, how do you deal with that? Um, that's a great question. It's been a, a lot of think pieces on it throughout the, the last few years. And I think what's helped me um, is surround yourself with people um, that you admire and you respect and um, that you want to aspire to be or just be with. I think having a strong network to bounce ideas off of, um, to get that pep talk that you need, uh, to, you know, you know, just hype yourself up. You need your own hype party. You need your own hype person, I would say, that you can WhatsApp and you can call for advice. Um, because, you know, it's a rigorous process to get into the foreign service. So if you pass, you belong here. You know, it doesn't matter which school you went to, it doesn't matter which jobs you had in the past, it doesn't matter how old you are, you belong here. And so I would just say surrounding yourself with people that are positive influences in your life. It can be your age or older. It doesn't have to be all older people. It can be peers. You can, peers can mentor each other. Um, I think that's really helped me throughout my career. Very good points. I mean, if you're, and just to also elaborate on the test, we, you know, that has gone through a bit of a few iterations. And so just know that that is also, I, I believe that there's a few changes there. So make sure you check out the website to know exactly how that works. But yeah, if you pass, you get in, you belong here. And so, uh, Armas, I wanted to ask you um, in general, uh, being a foreign service officer means you have to represent US foreign policy, even when sometimes you don't fully agree with it. Have you ever been in a situation where it was difficult to authentically represent the policy? How do you balance the duty of your job and your duty to your individual values and conscience? No, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I think, you know, what's, what's really important is you take, when you join the foreign service, you take the oath to the constitution. So that's the, the first thing. It's not tied to your career uh, diplomat. But what, what I think is people often don't understand is that there are many points along the way that you can influence the policy by being in the inside and be part of those policy discussions to shape it or to, to get your points across. It may not be front and center that the public is aware about but it's typically behind closed doors and you can influence the process so if you felt uh if i in my career if i felt that i was able to to make my arguments um on the particular policy and you know it was sufficiently heard there was debate about it i, I can be okay to then represent that externally um after having made my you know made the arguments that i could internally and, and be and try to be heard. I think the process internal internally is really really important. Um, and the the beauty of I guess the, the, the State Department is there are many different issues in the world that you can. There's so many different issues in the work. There are certain issues maybe I don't agree on, but I'm not working on those issues. I'm I'm more deliberate about what I'm going to work on uh, to be. You know that. You know I'm more deliberate what I what I work, what I work on. But overall, I think on, on this question is the reason you are, there's no point in being um, in an institution, whether it's State Department or something else, if you cannot be authentically yourself. So I think the premise of that question is I, I would never want to put myself in a position where I couldn't be authentic to myself. And if I was, I would have to really think about, and similar to what Naomi said, 
talk to mentors, talk to people. How am I dealing with this situation? How can I influence it? What tools for dissent do I have available to me? If it's really something that is um, that I truly disagree with, but I have to uh, think about the levers of power within the, in the institution I belong to. And is a, you know, there are different lever, levers of power and of influence that can be used to get your point across. But what I found in my career, at least, is that I've been able to negotiate uh, and maybe slightly change a certain policy by being within the room and being able to shift the conversation. So it's, it's a, a longer way to say that um, for me in my career, the way I've dealt with it is to not be silent when it was my opportunity to be able to um, influence the policy. But once the decision was made at a higher pig rate than or above me, I've had to learn to then uh, implement that policy and, and move forward with that. That's a really good point. I mean, about especially about uh, taking the oath to the Constitution. I think you know, even as our domestic pol politics sometimes get really polarized, it's important to remember our North Star. And so um, that's a really, really great points. I'm going to do one more question. Um, from the audience, and, and I'll kind of combine the two. Uh, Wes, I'll give this to you. Um, two, I'm co combining two, and one is, are you able to choose where you get deployed, deployed and how long does it take uh, you to learn a foreign language? All right, so when you join the Foreign Service, your first two assignments are directed, so you don't get to choose yourself you do get to kind of rank order things, you know, so you'll have a list of different open assignments in the world and you can rank order them and kind of explain your reasoning for why you're ranking things the way you are. And then you also have a career development officer um, that you work with who's almost like a, a counselor or kind of a career pathways type of person that you work with, their colleague, um, and they come together and they actually help direct the assignments for your first two assignments. Um, so you get some some say, but ultimately the choice is not yours for the first two assignments. You know, whenever we join the Foreign Service, you're also promising that you'll be worldwide available. Um, so flexibility is a huge thing there. You know, you've got to be flexible. You've got to be open to going to places that maybe you didn't exactly see yourself. Um, but sometimes, in a lot of cases, those places could end up being your best experiences. Um, so for the first two assignments, they're directed after that. Once you reach your kind of mid-level and you get tenure in the foreign service, then you have a bit more say. So every couple of years you are bidding or applying for new positions. You look at different positions around the world, see where your skills line up, and then you're applying for those. It can be a bit of a hectic process, you know, every couple of years, we all have to go through this. You're submitting your resume, you're making phone calls, you're doing interviews. Um, but ultimately, you always still land with a job. It just can depend on where your job is. But you do get more say as you go further along in the Foreign Service. Um, and then, sorry, Jenny, can you remind me what the second part of that question was? How long does it take you to learn a new language? Oh, yeah, new languages. So, you know, we have a Foreign Service Institute in Virginia, and that's kind of like our diplomat school where we go to for job training, for language training, for leadership management training. That's where we do all of our studies at. Um, and it's pretty cool. I mean, it's a big perk of being a US Foreign Service officer that you get paid to learn a foreign language. A lot of other countries' diplomatic corps don't get that same ability. So we're pretty lucky that we have it. Um, it can depend on what the language is. The Foreign Service Institute has different classifications of languages. So, you know, for extremely hard languages like Japanese, it could be a two-year program, for example. Um, for other languages like French or Spanish, it could be a six to eight month program. Also, if you come in with the ability to speak some languages already, you may test and kind of see where you rank on a scale. Um, we have a certain language scale as well at the Foreign Service Institute. And then that can place you in a, a certain, you know, time to learn a language too. Um, but typically you're learning most languages for, you know, that six to eight month range. So almost a year. And then some of the really hard languages, Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, at certain points, it could be a two year program. 
Yeah, being a part of uh, the Foreign Service Institute is really fun. It's kind of, I like to think of it like Hogwarts for diplomats, it's just like kind of <laughs> a little fun, different kind of environment over there. Um, and uh, so quickly, I'm just going to touch on one other question just because I want to address it really quickly. One person asked about being a woman in the Foreign Service. Um, and I, I'm just going to say, I, as a woman and a mother, um, you know, it's not always easy. Um, I do think that you a lot of things that uh, a lot of things that are challenging for both women and men is thinking about the career of your spouse. Um, also thinking about, you know, um, how people take what what depending on what country you went or you're in, um, how people people's perspectives on women and their and their roles and being able to even overcome that within yourself uh, and also it to the public. And then I would also say, um, you know, that there are a lot of little things that you don't think about when you're moving overseas as a mom. And I would say, like, recently the State Department did some really great work, and they they now that now they fund this shipment of milk overseas. So you know, I just had a baby, and so I'm able to now ship uh, um, milk that you know, like, if I pump a bunch of milk in the office or pump a bunch of milk while I'm on maternity leave, I I'm able to take that frozen milk and, and help there the state department helps me ship it to my next post which is really important because you know without that you sometimes you could lose all that and you need that for your kids and, and things like that and so these are like just like little things that you know we're still working on it and we still got a little bit of things to think about and, and, and i know naomi probably knows even better than me on a bunch of other uh, women's issues um but i just wanted to kind of briefly touch on that um because it is important to think about like just like day-to-day -day things that are really important where you get your hair done i for me, this is an issue. And so, um, uh, um, but yeah, those are all things to like think about and you know, have to work through when you change places and move, go, go overseas. Um, I wanna get like a 30 second answer from each person uh, just saying, what is an inspirational message that you want to give to the people who are at this webinar right now? Just one, one line, if you could do one line. Um, Naomi, let's start with you. The pressure. Okay. <laughs> One line. I would say whenever, this is going to be multiple lines, sorry. Whenever I talk to people about whether they're on the fence about joining the foreign service, I would, I always say, just apply. Um, don't doubt yourself. Just apply. It's a long process. Quickly, you can get through it in a year. Um, but I would just say, just do it. If you're thinking about doing it, if you have an interest in it, just apply and see what happens and then make your decision later. Wes? Yeah, believe in yourself. Um, it doesn't matter where you're from, uh, what your background is, how much money your family has, what school you go to, you can be a foreign service officer with us. You know, we come from every path of life. Um, so really, like Naomi just said, just do it, believe in yourself, apply, and you will be on the screen one day talking to another generation of future foreign service officers. Hermes? Um, one is don't let anybody dim your light, whether it's this career, or any career, please, you, we, need, we need your voice. That, that's very important. And the second thing is start to build your council of advisors. Who are the people, Naomi mentioned this earlier, who are the people in your life that you can go to, uh, professional, personal, that can help you think through your career at each stage of where you're at. Well, best of luck to all of you. Thank you so much. I wish I could give a round of applause because it's like, this is the thing about webinars, you can't hear everyone clapping or anything, but I, I'll, I'll do it for everybody. Um, thank you everyone, all the panelists for your participation today and all of the participants as well for just staying on and listening. And I just wanna invite you to continue to listen. Um, remember, remember we have a second part of the session uh, to the two, and then we also have the 2023 Inside for U.S. Foreign Policy series um, that's going to come up. So please um, follow follow us for that. I'm going to hand off to Mandy Johnson, um, who's going to uh, talk talk about the department uh, part, department's Bureau of Ta Global Talent Management, and so she's going to tell you more about kind of the, the in depth of uh, the HR part of all this. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. Have a great day.
Um, but my name is uh, Mandy Johnson. I'm a career foreign service officer as well. So it's so wonderful uh, to follow my inspiring colleagues uh, to talk about careers and student opportunities with the US Department of State. I am a proud Montanan, so I might debate with Wes, you know, which of those states are the most beautiful in the country. Um, but also I started my university career at the University of Montana as a Pell Grant student. Uh, so I've been a strong believer in the Gilman program. It didn't exist when I was a student, but I'm so happy that these and other student programs at the US Department of State really help break down barriers and provide access so that we have that rich uh, representation and diversity uh, throughout our programs uh, and our careers as well. So I'm going to share my screen here. You'll see that in the chat, I have been sharing a few links if it was relevant to what the speakers were saying earlier. Um, but also, um, I've shared a link uh, to join our talent network. That's an opportunity for you to identify what specifically you're interested in. It might be a career path. It might just be internships and fellowships. So that bit.ly link, uh, please do sign up if you'd like to be connected with us. We do lots of uh, events in person and online uh, to talk about uh, different opportunities with the US. US Department of State. So I encourage you to do that. And also, I previously was a diplomat in residence. I was based in Oklahoma, uh, reaching out to five states in the region there. Each uh, uh, state and also our US territories, we have a diplomat in residence who covers your area. So whether you are a faculty advisor or a student and are looking uh, to connect for resources, please do take advantage of that link. So have you, as you have heard from the Secretary of State, from our uh, colleagues, we are seeking a diverse group of talented Americans to represent America to the world. Truly any background, any walk of life, wh whatever your your work experience has been, your academic experience has been, there truly is a place for you at the U.S. Department of State. There are so many paths to success at the U.S. Department of State. We've heard from our panelists before who, like me, are Foreign Service officers. Uh, so the Foreign Service is a cohort uh, that's a rank in person system. So you join us as a group um, and then you have a series of assignments every two to three years where you serve both overseas and at home. So Foreign Service officers, we are generalists. Uh, there is an application process that I have shared in the chat previously as well. Um, I won't go into details here because uh, I want you to have the opportunity uh, to join our breakout sessions and have some me really meaningful discussions there as well. But I did share in the chat the link uh, to the quiz that you can take, as well as the application process to become a Foreign Service officer. But we also have peers uh, who are of equal rank uh, to Foreign Service officers are our specialists. Uh, they... Uh, provide vital uh, 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 support and make diplomacy happen. They are also diplomats in their own right in their own areas. So we are looking for IT managers. We're looking for engineers. Uh, whether it's to help secure our facilities overseas uh, or it's to help uh, construct our buildings and maintain our buildings as well. Um, we have doctors and medical professionals that are embassies overseas. We also have our own uh, federal law enforcement branch, uh, diplomatic security, and we have special agents uh, who are federal law enforcement officers uh, who also protect our people, uh, our facilities, and our information. And then we have uh, colleagues who who are also specialists that work in certain administrative fields. So you could do this as a generalist, as a foreign service officer, you could do this as a specialist. But if you just want to do, say, financial management, or you just want to do human resources, or you're really interested in logistics and uh, supply and travel and all of that type of support, there are areas where you can be highly specialized and still have that same system where you're serving at our embassies overseas and at home as well. For some people, they're very passionate about international affairs or having that experience for themselves and their families. Um, but we also have a large cohort of colleagues who are equally invaluable who are in the civil service. Uh, they are based in all career fields. Uh, 
that you heard referenced by a Foreign Service Officer panel today uh, that I mentioned for specialists as well. And they're highly specialized. Now that is just like the private sector, that's a rank and position system. So there's a specific job, you have those skills, uh, you apply to that position, and then you can work uh, largely in the DC metro area. But we also have passport offices around the country. Um, we also have uh, other presence, diplomatic security. We also provide support to other countries, diplomats who are throughout the United States as well. So there's lots of opportunities in that area. If you happen to be around Charleston, we have a large center there. Uh, and we also have a large presence in the greater Boston, uh, Portsmouth area as well. So lots of opportunities to uh, contribute to uh, the State Department through the civil service. If you are a native or heritage speaker or have studied Mandarin or Portuguese, or Arabic or Spanish, uh, you can also uh, become a consular fellow. So consular fellows, that's a limited non-career appointment. Um, we have a lot of students who apply to the consular fellows program uh, to get experience. And I'll talk about those 13 dimensions that, uh, that my colleague mentioned uh, earlier today. Um, but also just to get a feeling, you know, maybe you're like, this sounds like a neat opportunity with the State Department. I'm not sure um, if I'm ready to go to get this experience and kind of get a sense uh, of what's uh, possible, the Consular Fellows Program is an excellent opportunity. You will be doing the exact same work that our entry-level consular officers are doing. Uh, and uh, Wes was talking about tenure. So as part of the tenure process, all Foreign Service officers at least do one year of consular work. So Consular Fellows are doing the same work side by side. And it's a great opportunity because you can connect, you can network, you can find mentors, you can have opportunities to volunteer and support other uh, offices and sections within an embassy or consulate overseas. It's a great opportunity uh, to not only serve, uh, but to also uh, explore this career path as well, if you have the language skills. Um, and we work with our colleagues. The State Department is, of course, a very large uh, organization. And in addition to the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, which provides paid exchange programs and study abroad programs to uh, American citizens, uh, my bureau also uh, manages several internships, fellowships, and other programs as well that I will review. So there are so many opportunities. Uh, I literally could talk an hour in depth about all of these types of uh, opportunities, but the best way to go forward if you're interested in these types of careers is to visit uh, careers.state.gov, but to join our talent network at that bit.ly link and also reach out to connect to your diplomat in residence. But I will take time to talk about what are we looking for? Um, there was a conversation about imposter syndrome. So I grew up in Montana. I went to the University of Montana. My parents had graduated uh, shortly before I started myself. Um, and I was a Pell Grant student. I did work study on campus. I was active in student groups. And I had heard in sixth grade in La Grand Oregon uh, from my sixth grade teacher that her sister was in the Foreign Service. And I kind of was inspired by that in addition to the 20 other things I wanted to do at that age, it kind of stuck with me. So it was reinforced in high school in Montana by a history teacher. And then at university, I was fortunate that an ambassador from Montana, and there's very few of them, uh, very few uh, Montanans in the State Department, uh, just like West Virginians. Um, and he mentored a group of us. And actually, from that group, three of us are still with the State Department today. Um, but by being active in student groups by through necessity and also interest, I was working on campus and offices doing admin support. I would temp in the summers. Uh, over time, when I was a student, I gained leadership roles uh, in these student groups. I was able to go on a brief exchange overseas through a nonprofit, through the Model Arab League and Model UN. Um, but uh, I wasn't able to study abroad because at the time there were no scholarships. But in doing all of this, I developed these soft skills, these dimensions that we're looking for. Um, this is critical to be competitive in the Foreign Service, but I would argue 
in any career or any of the student programs we might have as well. So in all of the, what I learned was planning and organizing, being involved in these uh, organize, uh, in these initiatives, resourcefulness, working with others. Uh, I talked to my colleagues and they say, one of the best jobs they ever did to prepare themselves as diplomats that they didn't realize at the time, but still draw on today, is working in the service industry, um, being able to develop those communication skills, being able to work with different personalities and represent something else, a company, a group. So whether it was the family farm or working at, you know, in fast food or working in admin or whatever your career path has been um, that you have had as a student, all of it is valuable and contributes to you as a whole person. Because at the U.S. Department of State, we care about what you know, not who you know or how you know it. And coming from Montana, and I was like, oh, I would love to join the State Department, but I don't know. Um, I had this doubt, um, but I just stuck with it. And I had mentors who kind of backed me up and said, you know, just do it, just try. And it worked out. And it doesn't matter, you know, where you're from. We all contribute to this diversity. And once you're in, you're in. So I would encourage you to look at these dimensions, uh, maybe do a bullet list, draw from your own experiences of how you've demonstrated these skills and use that as a basis to kind of think about how you can uh, make yourself more competitive for these careers, um, but also for some of these student programs as well. So what programs are available? Um, so the uh, Education and cultural affairs, if you're not familiar with the Critical Language Scholarship, that's a great opportunity uh, to get intensive summer study abroad overseas in addition to Gilman. Um, that deadline just passed uh, this week, um, but it's offered every year. That's something that you, I would encourage you to consider. Um, the Department of Defense also provides an opportunity to get uh, those langu valuable language skills uh, through a paid program. The Bourne Awards, um, that deadline is coming up February 2nd. It's for both undergraduate and graduate students. That is a great opportunity as well. Um, my colleague mentioned that he participated in the Wrangell Summer Enrichment Program. I shared some information there too. It's absolutely fantastic. It's not that long-term commitment. So if you're a sophomore through a senior with a minimum of 3.2 GPA, that's a theme for all of these student programs. Most of them is a cumulative 3.2 GPA or higher. Um, I'd encourage you to apply. Uh, the deadline is February 9. And do reach out to your diplomat in residence um, so that you can uh, participate in events that they'll be doing about these programs and also uh, seek their advice. As the secretary mentioned, we're very proud uh, to have gotten uh, broad support from a bipartisan Congress to have paid uh, uh, State Department internships. These are full uh, time during the semester for so fall, spring, and summer. Um, and fall 23 will open in March for applications. So I do recommend that you look at those opportunities as well. And if you're familiar with the Virtual Student Federal Service, um, that's a great time. Perhaps you have uh, obligations or you can't travel um, to do an in-person paid internship, you can apply to the uh, Virtual Student Federal Service. Not only is that an opportunity to intern with the State Department virtually part-time 10 hours a week, but almost all of the rest of the federal government as well. If you're familiar with the program, we are changing the deadline. It used to be apply in July. Now it is in April. So it will be opening in April. I'd like to flag that for everyone. Again, if you join our talent network, you'll get all those notices as soon as they're available. So that is a great opportunity as well. And the US Foreign Service Internship Program, that is merit and needs-based. So the other programs, the paid student internship is just GPA. For US FSIP, it is both uh, GPA and needs-based. So um, if you're interested in that, again, connect with your diplomat in residence. That deadline is always in August. So it's right at the beginning of the fall semester. Semester. So keep your eye on that if you're interested. And of course, the Fulbright student program um, is fabulous as well. So why do these programs matter? Not only is it a great opportunity to get that international experience to learn more about the State Department, but of all of the members of the Foreign Service who joined in the year 2022, 29% of them had previously participated in either in a State Department student program. Uh, so it is a great pathway into these careers as well. 
to join the Foreign Service, you heard about the Pickering and Wrangell Fellowships. Uh, that is always open in September of every year. But we newly uh, started the Clark Diplomatic Security Fellowship. It is open now. It's the same premise of Pickering and Wrangell, which gives you a pathway to become a Foreign Service officer. Clark is a pathway to become a Diplomatic Security Special Agent, a federal law enforcement officer. Again, it's for graduate uh, education, uh, two years, uh, along with uh, mentorship, uh, two paid summer practicums or internships, and a five-year work commitment with us as well. If you have an IT background, you can also be an IT manager um, with us, and that would either pay for your final two years of undergraduate study or a two years master's degree in IT as well. So if you're interested in joining the Foreign Service, either as a Foreign Service officer, an IT manager, or a, a special agent, there are these opportunities uh, for you uh, to find a pathway into the Foreign Service. We also have pathways into the civil service. So again, civil service is domestic only. Um, if you are a graduate student, you can be a presidential management fellowship. Uh, it's a great way to join the civil service because you're joining as a cohort. Sometimes it's challenging because you have to apply for each individual uh, position uh, as it becomes available. But with the presidential management fellowship, kind of like the foreign service fellowships, you apply for a cohort at a certain time. You have a paid one, one year fellowship uh, with the State Department or any other federal agency. And at the end, you can compete to convert to full time positions and full time positions um, that are at the mid-level and not the entry level. So a very excellent program uh, to consider. You can apply uh, the second year of your graduate program up to uh, two years after you graduate. We also have the recent graduates program uh, where you can apply for positions. Those are as they can become available, um, but that is another excellent way to get your foot in the door uh, as a civil servant. And we also launched, as the secretary mentioned, the Powell Leadership Program. Uh, so that closed in October. It will be opened again uh, next fall, likely in October. And it's a one-year fellowship either as a, a recent graduate um, or an internship uh, while in student status as well. Um, we have smaller uh, programs that also provide opportunities in STEM policy and foreign affairs. And these are all programs that will become available. How do you find out about them? Well, in addition to going to careers.state.gov, if you sign up at that bit.ly link, you will receive notifications and updates when these programs become available. Just make sure that you note that you are interested in internships and fellowships. So I know that was a lot of information uh, very quickly. Um, we do have that background information with IIE, um, but please do uh, reach out to careers.state.gov to your diplomat in residence to learn more. Thank you. Hi, Mandy. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wonderful resources for our audience today and encourage you to look at the resources available in the chat. Very excited. Thank you so much, Mandy. We are now going to be moving to our breakout sessions. Uh, on the slide, you will see your there are nine room options. Each room uh, gives you an opportunity to um, hear from someone more closely um, about their work and career pathways to State Department careers. So nine options. So for example, room one, uh, Wes Jeffers will be speaking about the FSO, Foreign Service Officer Perspective, life and work in the Foreign Service from West Virginia to Wellington. So what we're going to do is we're going to open the breakout rooms. You will have the option to choose what breakout room you would like to go to. You can also bounce between breakout rooms if you would like, but the rooms will be open um, here in a second. It should show up on the screen. I told my friend Karen, I told my friend Karen that I would keep this to 60 seconds for those of you that have come back to join us. Thank you very much for joining us today. Join us for the 2023 Inside U.S. Foreign Policy, Policy Series. You can see the topics there. Um, thank you to all of our panelists, to the Secretary of State for taking his time, to our colleagues at IIE who have helped us, uh, to who work with us to uh, create and sustain the Gilman program. And thanks to all of you. Hopefully you found uh, something uh, useful in, in today's uh, presentation, today's event. Um, we will be sending a, um, a, a survey out 
tell us what we did well, tell us what you're interested in, tell us what we could improve on. So thank you everybody for joining us. We will see you uh, in 2023 uh, as we kick off the Inside U.S. Foreign Policy Series uh, with these topics there uh, and, and can't thank you enough. Have a great uh, weekend uh, and happy Thanksgiving to those of you uh, who are getting ready for that. Um, here's uh, your email, uh, just a little bit on the feedback. Uh, and you can also say send information to Gilman Events. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day. Take care.